In 1871, the Church of England decided that the King James Version should be revised. Two unsaved scholars would see to it that a completely new Bible would be created to replace the King James Version. Who were these two men? Fenton John Anthony Hort and Brooke Foss Westcott. These two men would use two of the Roman Catholic Church's Greek manuscripts to design their new version. The first is known as Codex Vaticanus. The second is called Codex Sinaiticus and was found in the trash at a Catholic monastery by Constantine von Tischendorf. Their corrupt revised version was released in 1881. But what about the beliefs of Westcott and Hort? In 1896, a collection of Hort's letters were published by his son. On page 76 we read, the pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. On page 148, Hort writes about the ordinary confused evangelical notions. On page 400, Hort admits that the positive doctrines even of the evangelicals seem to me perverted rather than untrue. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority and especially the authority of the Bible. On page 445, Hort says, I have a sort of craving that our text should be cast upon the world before we deal with matters likely to brand us with suspicion. I mean a text issued by men already known for what will undoubtedly be treated as dangerous heresy will have great difficulties in finding its way to regions which it might otherwise hope to reach, and whence it would not be easily banished by subsequent alarms. Hort shows his hatred for the true Greek text on page 211 where he states, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of texts. Having read so little Greek testament and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus. He also says, think of that vile Textus Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. It is a blessing there are such early ones. In a letter to Westcott, Hort writes on page 430, Certainly nothing can be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ bearing our sins and sufferings to his death, but indeed that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. On page 120, Hort declares, the fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man's suffering in his own person the full penalty for his sins. Hort clearly did not believe that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was enough to pay for his sins. But what about Westcott? What did he believe? In 1903, Westcott's son Arthur published his father's letters in a book. On pages 228 through 229, Westcott told Hort what he thought of the Textus Receptus. I feel most keenly the disgrace of circulating what I feel to be falsified copies of Holy Scripture, and am most anxious to provide something to replace them. He went on to say of the Christians of his day, but pray think how utterly ignorant and prejudiced even well-informed men are on the text of the New Testament. On page 52, Westcott said, I never read an account of a miracle, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability and discover some want of evidence in the account of it. In volume 2, page 49, Westcott gives his views on heaven. He writes, it saves us from the error of connecting the presence of Christ's glorified humanity with place. Heaven is a state and not a place. On page 394, Westcott states, If Tennyson's idea of heaven was true, that heaven is the ministry of soul to soul, we may reasonably hope by patient, resolute, faithful, united endeavor to find heaven about us here, the glory of our earthly life. Westcott shows his love for Roman Catholicism on page 81 when he writes, 
After leaving the monastery, we shaped our course to a little oratory which we discovered on the summit of a neighboring hill, and by a little scrambling we reached it. Fortunately, we found the door open. It is very small, with one kneeling place, and behind a screen was a paeta, the size of life, i.e. a virgin and dead Christ. The sculpture was painted, and such a group, in such a place, and at such a time was deeply impressive. I could not help thinking of the fallen grandeur of the Romish church, on her zeal even in error, on her earnestness and self-devotion, which we might, with nobler views and a purer end, strive to imitate. Had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. It truly is sad to think that an intelligent man like Westcott could not bring himself to believe in miracles or heaven. But Westcott and Hort were both involved in something far more sinister than textual criticism. In 1845, they joined the Hermes Club. In 1851, they formed the Ghostly Guild, which was followed by the Uranus Club in 1872. These clubs were involved in necromancy, or trying to make contact with dead spirits. Why would two men who claim to be saved have such an interest in the spirit world? Should a Christian really trust a text or a Bible which can be traced back to these two men? Westcott and Hort's corrupt Greek text and their theories of textual criticism would go on to produce over 200 new versions in the next 120 years.